this is my first conference since the pandemic, and I, I'd forgotten how uncomfortable these Britney Spears microphones are. Uh, they're definitely not made for people with glasses, so there's a design opportunity there for anyone who's into that. Um, I want to start by telling something um, that happened to me. When I told my CEO at the company I work at that, oh, my talk has been accepted to Svetog conference, he was wondering, oh, what, what are you going to talk about at a, at a developer conference? You work with design now. Uh, and I showed him the title of my talk, and um, he immedi immediately asked me, okay, so what are the things you're going to share? And this was, let's say, a long time ago, so I hadn't really compiled the list yet. So I told him, yeah, I haven't really figured that out, but I, I have some ideas in mind. And then he told me, with a big grin on his face, and was like, you should go there and share two things. And then he waited for my reaction, see if I got his joke. And I was like, ah, under delivering <laughs> at a developer conference like this, they probably won't appreciate that kind of joke. Uh, and then he immediately said, okay, Share 16 things then. Uh, no, I'm not going to do that either. So <laughs> just to align our expectations, I'm going to share 10 things, 10 written in decimal format, binary, uh, no, in, in base 10. So nothing more, nothing less. So 10 things every developer should know about UX and design, according to me. Um, so I work at the company called Detectify, where we apparently have this kind of CEO. Um, it's a company founded by hackers. They found that the internet was broken, still is, so our mission is to help people fix it. And we do it by having a product that can automate hacker capabilities. So it's a very technical, heavy company. But at the same time, it's a company that really values design. So design plays a very big role in deciding the product development and the direction. So I work there as head of product design, together with five other product designers. One of them is here today. <laughs> and uh, all our product designers work in cross-functional teams. So in their day-to-day, -day, they collaborate mainly with engineers and developers. And I have previously worked at Microsoft, and I have an educational background in software engineering and interaction design. But I have mainly worked with design, because that's where my passion is but always in a very technical focused context, because that's where I feel at home. So I have the utmost appreciation for both profession, both engineering and design. And I think the merge when things happen together is where magic can happen, where magic can happen. So with that said, I want to also share a disclaimer uh, around this talk. I am in no way trying to suggest or even encourage a developer to necessarily do design work. Just like I wouldn't encourage designers to necessarily do developers work. Um, both are equally important professions. Both requires experience and a set of skill set that you need to require through uh, exercising and then practice and actually working with it. It takes time to develop skills, both engineering skills and designer skills. What I do encourage with this talk is for each profession to learn more about each other so you don't stay in some, some sort of silos, but actually understand each other and be able to speak similar language so you can build great uh, user experience together. Uh, so what I hope this talk will give you is 10 things or ways to connect with your designer and together level up the de developer-designer collaboration. And the first thing I want to start with is just a reminder. Um, that design is not art. Um, there's a difference. Of course, they're not completely separate. They overlap a little bit. But I'm going to talk about them as if they are very separate, just to make the point. And there is the point, and I'm going to tell you why it matters uh, by showing you an example. Here you see um, an art exhibition space. Imagine there's paintings hanging on the wall where you see the white uh, placeholder. Uh, those paintings are artistic expression. That's art. The space, however, however has been designed. Um, it has a purpose. It's intended for a specific audience. It's to display art for, hopefully, an audience that appreciate art. So the space has been designed with, um, with a goal in mind, with intended user in mind, and for a specific purpose. So design has an intent. And with art, there's a freedom of choice for the artist to choose 
uh, how to go about to create that art. Um, with design, however, it should be grounded in actual user insight. It shouldn't be based on a designer's personal opinion unless the designer is designing for themselves. Now, designers have lots of opinion, of course, but it's not their opinion that should steer the direction of the actual design. And because the outcome differs, the method also matters. Um, with art, there's a freedom in choosing the way you create your art, but with design, method matters. So there is an intent in every step when it comes to design. And when you look at a piece of great art, usually you can tell who the artist is because it's a form of self-expression. But when you look at something that's been great, that is a great design, usually you can't tell who the, the designer is. Maybe you can tell what brand it is, maybe what company it comes from, but then it's also a job well done by the designer because that's the intent that the design should speak the brand of the company. Yep, so great art, you can uh, tell who the art is, but great design simply solves a problem. Uh, with that, I want to move on to the next thing that I find is quite universal. It's something that I use for almost everything uh, in life. Um, it's something that I think is very true to be able to stay aligned with the purpose, sort of always starting with why. Figuring out your decision should be aligned with your purpose. And um, I want to show you a couple of examples where I think um, are exemplary of great design that has been staying very much aligned with its purpose. Um, this is a picture that my colleague shared with me recently. Uh, she showed her work in progress of knitting a sock and while she was waiting at a hospital waiting room. And I immediately got fascinated by the pattern of the sock. And I was writing to her and saying that, oh, wow, this is such a cool pattern. It almost looked like the yarn was made to become a sock. And she said, actually, it is. Um, this ball of yarn is called raggi. Uh, in Swedish, there's something called ragsocka. It's like a rugged sock, like a wool, sturdy sock that you usually wear when it's this kind of weather, cold outside and you want to feel cozy and warm. And this ball of yarn is called raggi. And it is actually designed and made, intended to become a rugged sock. And the material is also a bit more durable because socks get worn out and it's made to keep people warm. So there was an attempt with this ball of yarn to become a sock. I thought that was quite nice. Another example of great design back in the days when typewriters were was a thing is this. Um, maybe you've had the delightful experience of actually typing on a typewriter. But if you don't, I'm pretty sure you've seen videos or clips where you actually see how they work. So when you press down one of these keys, there is a mechanical hook there at the further inside the typewriter that gets that sort of swings back and then forth and stamps on the paper to leave a mark. If you push down two letters that are close together, there's a risk that the hook gets stuck on each other and then you have to entangle them, and that sort of slows down the typing speed. So when they designed the layout of where to put the keys on the typewriter, they took that into account. So they sort of analyzed the English words, the letters that were commonly used together, they put a little bit further apart. So people could keep up a certain speed without risking the hooks to get caught on each other. So that sort of made people have a little bit of a jumping <laughs> way of typing when they type with typewriters. But that was a nice design, taking into the consideration of the limitation of the mechanical um, context. What I don't like <laughs> is that when we got computers and uh, the designer designed the, uh, the digital keyboards, the layout of the keys are just copy-paste. Even though we don't have the mechanical constraints with a digital keyboard, you can mash all the keys all at once without anything getting stuck, hopefully. But we still use the same keyboard layout. A better design, and something that I take every opportunity to talk about, is the Dvorak keyboard layout. Um, they actually did a reanalysis of what are the commonly used letters. And then without having to think about the constraint of any mechanical parts getting stuck together, they just put all those letters on the home row, 
where you rest your fingers if you do the touch typing technique. So with this layout, they could increase the typing speed and take into consideration ergonomic aspects. So Dvorak is said to be, be more designed for faster typing speed and more ergonomical um, ways of typing. Uh, I've been using this since I was 18, and I can highly recommend it. Uh, if you want to switch over, um, let me know, and I can give you some tips on how to get started. It takes some practice, but once you get into this, you never want to go back to Crafty, I promise you. Yeah, so this is uh, a couple examples of design that I think are aligned with their purpose, thinking about the user, thinking about the context, and it results in great design. So how do you find your purpose then? So how do you know what to align with? I want to take a moment to talk about ikagai. Um, it's a Japanese concept. Literal translation would be the reason for being or your purpose. Now, there's a deeper philosophical meaning behind ikagai. Uh, but I, at the same time, also like the popularized version because it helps get to a certain point, and it can also be useful. And it's that kind of popularized way of thinking about ikagai that I'm going to talk about now. Uh, so in order to find your ikagai, uh, this is the way you could do it. Start by imagining a circle that contains everything that the world needs. So by looking at uh, the outside world, you can sort of pinpoint that. Then you start thinking about another circle that contains everything you're good at. And by listening to feedback and what people say about you, you can probably pinpoint those things. And there's one area, hopefully, probably, most likely, where those two circles overlap. It's not going to be a perfect overlap. I mean, I'm apparently very good at uh, doing jigsaw puzzles. <laughs> I don't even like looking at the cover. As soon as I get a jigsaw puzzle, I take remove the cover, and then I just dump out the pieces and put them together. Um, I've, yet find, I, I've yet to find a need for that in the world. Uh, but if you ever <laughs> see that kind of user need, let me know. I'm here, <laughs> happy to do those things. Uh, but yeah, in the middle there, there's an overlap, something that the world needs that you're also good at. Then there's another circle containing everything you can get paid for. So there are things that are need, good at, but maybe not everything you can get paid for. And then the fourth circle contains everything you love. That's your passion. And only you know what that truly is. It's not what people say you should be striving for. It's not what society thinks is valuable. It's what you really feel passionate. That's why you, you know, get out of bed in the morning, hopefully. And there's a one area in the middle where all these four circles overlap. And that is your ikagai. And because we're different and circumstances changes, ikagai is not something static. It's something that sort of evolves over time and when things change and so on. So this is something I usually think about once in a while for myself, but it's also something that you can apply on different levels. You can think about what is your ikagai within the company you're working for. And in that sense, it's more that, oh, what does the company need right now rather than maybe the user? Or if you expand it more, what is the ikagai of my company? What is the need of the user? What is it that uh, the people at my company are good at? And what is it that our user are willing to pay for and hopefully aligns with the company's purpose? So that's one way of figuring out your purpose, your company's purpose, or in whatever kind of aspect. All right. The next thing I want to share is to emphasize the importance of knowing your users. Um, I've said before that a designer is not designed for themselves, and hopefully no one is creating a product for themselves unless they will be happy with just having one user. Um, so your own opinion matter less than your intended user's opinions. So it's very important to get to know the users, and because people change, it's a continuous process. So you need to maintain that conversation. And the best way to get to know a user or get to know anyone is, of course, to meet them and talk to them uh, directly. So direct user feedback, continuous direct user feedback is the best. The second best thing would be secondary user feedback. So maybe you're in a bigger company, and if you can't have direct contact with your customers, maybe you have uh, a group of people who are salespeople or customer success people who speak to prospect or customers on a daily basis and they can sort of be 
um, your your spokesperson for your users. That would be the second best. But of course, direct feedback is always the best. If you're lucky to be able to get direct contact and meet your users, so what do you do then? Well, there's a lot of interviews guidelines on how to ask non-leading questions. So I'm not going to go into that, but happy to talk about that too, because that's something that I'm very uh, passionate about. Um, but one general tip is that you don't just ask, what do you want? Because that's something apparently Henry Ford did not say, <laughs> that if he had asked user what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Um, so you need to sort of, when they say what they want, you need to sort of understand why they want it. And then when they tell you that, you see, need to ask them again and again and again. So you sort of need to be like the Backstreet Boys or annoying three-year-old. Sort of like ask them why, why, why at least three times. If you can do it five times or seven times, even better. But try to do it um, by being less annoying than the Backstreet Boy or a three-year-old. And that's a skill as well to acquire those kind of way of asking questions. They're non-intrusive, but still get you to the actual user need. Yep, uh, it gets us to the third thing, catch the attention and keep it. And now when I look at it, I sort of wish I'd put the parenthesis on the top part, <laughs> because I think um, catching the attention is less important than actual keeping. It's a keeping the attention that's the most important. Um, but I want to start with talking about the attention first. Have you heard uh, that goldfish has an average attention span of nine seconds? Have you heard about the study that showed that humans in the digital area have an average attention span of eight seconds? And have you heard that because of this, we need to design experiences for people who apparently can't keep their attention longer than a goldfish? It's not true. So this study has been debunked. It was based on flaky methods. It was not peer reviewed. Um, yeah, so it's been criticized a lot. The original report doesn't even exist on the Microsoft website anymore. They've taken it away. But all these other reports and articles that just echoed those findings still exist. And once in a while, I hear references to this kind of study and this kind of people with in the digital age has short attention span and so on, but it's not true. And I'm not here to make a point or cast blame on anyone who believed it in or echoed it. I have most likely done these things as well. But I just want to highlight the fact that false facts circles around and remember to not just take something as it is, check the sources, use your critical thinking, even with the things I'm saying today, and make sure that what you actually put into use to base your design decision on is actually something that you can stand for. So let's say we do have a longer attention span than a goldfish. Um, but still, people don't have unlimited patience. I mean, I'm sure all of us has lost our patience once or twice, maybe three times. Um, but yeah, that's at least something we know it's true. So how do we catch someone's attention and keep it is the question. Well, it's um, a little bit like dating. <laughs> um, you need to catch attention maybe by being a little bit different or interesting in some way. But most important, to maintain a meaningful relationship, you need to constantly provide meaningful interactions. If you're dating and you tell a joke, you might be conceived as funny. But if you tell the same joke over and over and over and over and over again, you're not going to be funny anymore. And it's the same kind of relationship you have with your users. Um, you need to continuously build meaningful interaction and make it meaningful for them to continue consuming your product or your service. That's hopefully for their good. Um, so how do you catch attention and keep it? Well, catching attention is sort of the easy part. I mean, you could even, well, it's, it's about being clear your purpose, understand the user need, and then clarify the value up front. You could even lie about it, I guess, but you better provide the value soon enough until the user sees right through it, and then, then they won't stick around. So what I'm trying to say is that catching the attention is the easy part. 
is the keeping the attention that actually plays the major role. I mean, I could even get behind the saying of fake it until you make it, um, but it is called fake it until you make it. It's not called fake it or make it. You get what I mean? So if you catch your attention, you better provide the actual value that you're saying that you're bringing. And that brings us to something that's more closer aligned with my, my values, which is to have integrity. If you say something, do it. And be honest. Be transparent and honest and don't lie. Don't try to trick your users. Um, because the integrity and honesty is what build loyal relationship. And loyal users are the best kind of users. They are the one that will stick around without carrots and sticks. They believe in your value, you provide the value, and it becomes a win-win kind of relationship. So it is, it feels a little bit dumb to even ask, how do you have integrity? How do you be honest? Uh, hopefully that's not something you have to ask yourself, but apparently when it comes to design, it is a valid question to ask. Because unfortunately, there are a lot of patterns in design that we are getting used to that are deceptive design patterns or dark patterns, they're called. It's a term coined by a UX specialist that started noticing kind of deceiving, sneaky, flaky kind of behavior in very popular apps and products that we use on a daily basis. And he categorized the different patterns. There's 12 of them. He created a website. And he sort of started adding sort of like a wall of shame of companies and products and services that are using these kind of patterns. And I'm sure you're familiar with them if I mention a couple. It's, for example, services that makes it very easy to sign up, but very, very hard to cancel the membership. Or I'm sure you have been online shopping. You added one item to the shopping cart, but at the end, you ended up paying for one pack of six items because the shopping online shopping tried to be helpful by adding uh, a pack of something that was currently on um, what do you call a uh, lower price and that's what they think you should buy so those kind of pattern are called deceptive design pattern because it's not with the best intent of the user so don't use them the next thing is uh, to keep it simple uh, or at least as simple as possible. It should be easy for the user to get to the goal, the reason why they're using your product or your service. Anything else that you're adding that's in the way of the user reaching that goal is distraction and should be questioned whether it should be there or not. Probably not. Because most likely, hopefully, you're not creating a Times Square experience where everything is screaming for attention all at once. It should be very clear for the user what to do at every step in the process. And the fewer steps to reach your goal, the better. So try to keep it simple. And I'm going to keep this simple by leaving it here. With the next thing, uh, which is that UI is like a joke. If you have to explain it, explain it it's not good enough. Um, it's a quote I read somewhere. I don't know who said it, so I can't give credit appro appropriately. And I thought it was sort of smart, and uh, but, or and. Um, with a lot of these tweetable, funny, witty, sort of smart uh, quotes, at first glance, they seem to be true and hold in all cases. But again, if you look at it and start criticizing a little bit, you sort of realize that it falls into the category, like with all design decision, that it depends. Not everything can be self-explanatory. And that is because there's only one intuitive interface for the human being. I'm going to leave that as a cliffhanger. Um, but everything else has been learned. We have learned to operate and to see what something, what affordance something has because of past experience. But there is an advantage to that because we are human beings. We like to learn things. Um, if you design things for the regular convention, people will have learned it somewhere else, so you don't have to explain it when people use your product or service. And that takes us to uh, Jacob's Law. 
It's one of a couple of laws of UX. This one says that users spend most of their time on other websites. Uh, keep that in mind. So if you use the convention that other websites use, the user will already know how to use things on your website in this case. So you don't have to have explanatory text or explanatory guides to explain your UI. In that case, the UI is self-explanatory because people have learned it elsewhere. So that's the power of consistency. And there's also power in consistency within your app or your product or your service, of course. Um, you don't need the user to get surprised whenever they switch a page or whenever they navigate to another screen. Um, consistency um, enables people to use things more efficiently. Now, some people might say that's boring, <laughs> that consistency sort of limits their creativity. Well, the fact is, you don't have to innovate on everything. And the truth is, you don't have time to innovate on everything. Um, maybe you don't have to innovate a new way of scrolling a page or having innovative and um, surprisingly different buttons on every page. That's not the true value of innovation. So something that can help you to have consistency and maintain it and get time to actually innovate on things that matters is using a design system. With a design system where you have a reusable component, it should enable you to do 80% of your work in 20% of your time, so you can spend 80% of your time innovating on the 20% of your work where it actually makes a difference, where innovation actually provides user value for their experience. I'll let that sink in for a second. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but um, it's something that Lisa Apers talks about in her uh, presentation that she did at a design conference called Design Matters. Uh, I will highly suggest you check this out if you're interested in uh, design systems and what value that can bring. But her point is um, this that I'm um, repeating here. Uh, I want to call out on myself for using <laughs> the light bulb icon there to uh, symbolize innovation. I don't like that, but uh, yeah, I, I, I did it here. It's because I think innovation, it's a process. It's not something that happens immediately. So I think a better icon to symbolize that is a dimmer, but that's a <laughs> boring icon and not according to convention and for consistency's sake, so you won't have to know what that dimmer means. I used a light bulb, but I think innovation is more like a dimmer. It's like a, it's a process that happens, not instant switch. Uh, of a light. And with that, it sort of segues into this, is to embrace the design process, because it is a process. Success doesn't happen overnight. It's a long journey of trial and error behind every success, also design success. So you should embrace that and enjoy the journey of trial and error. Um, I'm going to look at my note. So there's something that um, the architect Frank Lloyd Wright captured quite nicely. So he's an architect, American architect, that has um, designed many of the popular buildings in the US mainly. And he said something like this. An architect's most useful tools are an eraser at the drafting board and a wrecking ball at the construction site. So you don't get it right on the first try, not even on the second try, or not even when things have been built and put in place, apparently, even in the architect world, in the physical world, not in the, our digital world. And you can easily imagine where in the process it's more cost efficient and resource efficient to make changes. So just like in product development, in building world domain, um, it's also more cost efficient to do it as early as possible. So try to what they say, fail early, fail often. I prefer the saying, learn early, learn often. So you can sort of correct yourself and modify things to better suit your intended users. And one, one if efficient way to learn early and often is to share early and often, share your work in progress and be open to feedback. Um, and that is something a lot of designer are ingrained with to have design critiques. So they share their work in progress and welcome feedback. I'm 
want to take a moment here uh, to share one thought I have about this feedback process that I, I don't think has been highlighted enough. And I'm going to take this opportunity because I have a group room full of developers that I hope care about design and designers um, to say this. Um, yeah, so designers, what I have said earlier, they don't have this artistic ego behind their work. So it's not a form of self-expression when they show you their design work and ask for your feedback. But hopefully, there's still a sense of pride in what they've created. I'm sure you can re relate to that as a developer. When you have written those lines of code and it compiles, I hope you feel a sense of pride, even though it's not a way of self-expression for you when you do your work. There's still some pride connected to that. So you can sort of hopefully relate to the feeling of a designer that's showing their work in progress. But let me ask you this. How early and how often do you share your work in progress to ask for feedback of your code that doesn't even compile yet? And how early and how often do you ask a designer for feedback on that? I have yet to hear it happen, and there's reason behind that, of course, probably. Uh, probably valid reason, also connected to the fact that design is usually more visual, everybody can have an opinion about design, and with code, it's sort of harder to maybe give helpful feedback. Maybe you need to have more specific knowledge about that in order to be helpful. But that's my point. Uh, when someone asks for feedback, they're asking for helpful feedback. So try to keep that in mind. Um, so try to provide with helpful feedback when anyone asks for your input. So how do you give helpful feedback on design work in specific? Well, different types of feedback are useful at different types of stages of a design work. Because design goes through this design process. It goes through a stages of maturity. And in a perfect world, what you are seeing or trying out should have the fidelity of the maturity stage of the design work. So you should sort of be able to tell based on the look or feel of the experience you're trying out what kind of feedback is useful. Usually, if you're presented with a napkin sketch, it's not the time to give critique about the actual shape of that hand-drawn button, unless you are uh, exploring the shape of the button when you sketch. So with design, things depends. And even though we don't, and because we don't live in this perfect world, and because design depends, the easiest way to know what helpful feedback is is to simply ask, what type of feedback would be helpful for you to receive right now? What stage is the design work in? And uh, in our team, oh, sorry, I also want to say this. <laughs> Uh, since I like the iterative process and I wanted to emphasize the learning process, I wanted to change this to embrace the learning process. Yes. But this is what I wanted to share now. This is something we use in the design team. We have a design critique template. And part of that template has this part, which is to, for the design to indicate in what maturity stage their work currently is to make it easier for people to give helpful feedback. So if the designer has indicated that it's in an early stage, then it's part of an exploratory work, so anything goes. All kinds of wild ideas and feedback are welcome. But maybe not feedback about the exact copy is probably not the most helpful feedback at that stage. If it's in the mid-maturity stage, then um, the goals and objective for the design is set, so sort of what they're trying to figure out is zeroing in on the sort of direction of design. So then they welcome what is working, what is not working. And it's maybe not as helpful anymore to suggest completely new and wild idea that's completely would steer design work to another direction at that point. And then if it's at the late design stage, it's about perfecting the details. At that stage, uh, feedback about the actual visual design, the details on the interaction is most useful. Even copy feedback would be perfect at that stage. But new ideas about the feature that will change the whole underlying structure and flows is probably not the most helpful. Yes, a question. Oh, sorry, copy is the text, what is written on a, in the interface. Good question. The question was, what do I mean about copy? Um, yeah, feel free to ask any clarifying question if I throw out words that 
means something to me, but means something else to you. <laughs> so yeah, when I say copy, it's about the micro copy of a button or what is written in, uh, in a digital product, the text, basically. Yeah, uh, another thing that we found helpful is to use colored post-its when we ask for feedback. Uh, we started with this because of the pandemic and we had to figure out a way to get feedback um, remotely, but it's something that we continued with because it doesn't only um, make it possible for remote people to give feedback, and, but it also um, allows asynchronous feedback to be given. And the written format also enables more democratic uh, feedback sessions. So it's not one person taking up the whole meeting time sharing their feedback while the others are just listening, but opening up the session and letting everyone use Post-it so it gives everybody equal space to express their thoughts and opinions. So it's something that we've continued with, and we use not just colors, of course, but also we tag them uh, to make sure it's accessible for everyone, the type of feedback. And it also enables instant documentation. It's their actual words, so it's not someone having to transcribe and document the feedback afterwards, so it's just instantly there. And having this um, group of feedback with these notes available for the person we're asking feedback from also encourage them to think about the different kinds of feedback that can be useful. So both things that they like about it, things that they dislike, but also encourage ideas, question, comments, or just replying to somebody else's feedback. So sometimes we get a long thread like, a, like an old forum post in a design with people conversationing with each other, which is interesting also for other people to see and also for us to uh, look back to understand the reasoning. So this is something we work with. The next thing I want to share is to treat a bug as a bug and depth as depth, no matter if it's tech or design. Um, it's sort of old fashioned, and I'm sure you also agree with me, to think that, oh, as long as it works, it's good enough. That's no longer the minimal bar, of course. Uh, we should all have a joint ownership of the user experience, which both functionalities and how things are experienced contributes to. So with that said, depth is something that hinders a great user experience, so that is something we should deal with. And there are some people that say that because of this agile ways of working, we sort of accumulate depth more quickly because whatever you shipped yesterday becomes depth when you ship something new today. Um, but I think that happy developers and happy designers equal happy customers. And nobody is happy with increasing depth that is never taken care of. So take care of your depth. Um, and with Agile, it's not just about shipping fast, it's about shipping value fast. And taking care of your depth is part of that. So you should be able to iterate faster and taking care of the depth to provide faster value. So how do you treat depth equally? Uh, well, just treat design depth like you treat uh, tech depth. And hopefully you can do that in a better way if you think uh, tech depth is not treated well enough, but it could be maybe bringing it all together in the same backlog, prioritizing them in the same way, but just treat them equally. Uh, there's different ways of prioritizing. One way I like is to use the user impact and effort to fix matrix. So you gather all your bugs and depth, both design and tech, in the same group, and together with the whole team, you sort of map them out. Where in this matrix do they fit in? Uh, compared to each other. So you'll have end up with some things that will bring a lot of user value if they're fixed, but might be hard or take a long time, a lot of effort to fix. So they will end up high up, far to the right, and things that affect user a lot, but are easy fix will end up high up, far to the left. And then things that maybe are not going to bring so much user value if they're fixed or not, they'll end up at the lower area and depending on how much effort they take to fix you align them on that scale. And with this, you sort of get an overview of how things are related to each other, both design and tech. And this also gives you an overview of what to start with. So you should probably start with things that have higher user value. Maybe take the low-hanging fruit and do the quick wins first. And the things that are sort of on the top left, no, top right, 
uh, are more like major projects, maybe needs a little planning. So that needs to take into account. And then at the bottom, right, the thankless task might be questionable whether you should fix them or not. But with this kind of view, you sort of should be able to prioritize them more equally and know where to start. Yes, the last thing I want to share, uh, hopefully it doesn't need much explanation because I sort of started uh, with a disclaimer saying that I think magic happens when developers and designer collaborate and work together. And that's when I think one plus one can equal three or Fusion Ha. Um, if you know the reference of Fusion Ha, you also know that the equation on top is very, very modest. Because if you if you're able to do a correctly perform fusion dance, <laughs> you'll end up <laughs> with a result that's more powerful than it multiplied several fold. And maybe now I've lost most of the people. Does anyone know the reference fusion? <gasps> awesome. <laughs> do you also use Dvorak? <laughs> No, never too late to start, but yeah. <laughs> okay, the point is that um, when people with different skills, highly skilled, powerful people work together, they can become more than themselves, even just the sum together. And that's what I want to emphasize. Um, yeah, um, don't know if I need to say too much, but I want to emphasize that it's not tech versus design or you versus me or us versus them. It's us for them, the users, right? So we're working together with an intent of creating a better world for our intended users, hopefully. So we should work and collaborate jointly for the same goal, the same purpose. Um, and there's one thing I recently read that I think is sort of a nice way to think about it, or, or that I'm curious to try out. I haven't tried this out yet, so I don't know if it works. Uh, but I want to share this with you to see if you also agree with me that it's sort of interesting. But it is to, at mid-discussion, try to switch position and argue for the other point of view. Because sometimes when you're discussing, you get so caught up in your own argument that you're, you stop listening. You just focus on winning the argument when the purpose is to get to the best decisions. So if you at me discussion, if you're still aware of <laughs> what's going on, you can try switch those position and try to argue for each other's position. That sort of forces you to understand the other pro or try, try to understand the other person's point of view. And hopefully at the end, you get to the best decision instead. And with this said, I want to summarize by recapping 10 things about UX and design that I've shared. And I intentionally call them things. And I intentionally didn't call them guidelines or rules, especially not rules, uh, because I think rules are meant to be broken. And guidelines is something that has been put in practice and be proven to work. But I think with design, it all depends. So I rather call them things. And you can do whatever you want with things. So yeah. These are 10 things. But sometimes I could even stretch and also think them as tips, because it's the same thing there. You can take it or leave it. So feel free to pick and choose what you think makes sense for you and your context. But uh, the 10 things I shared can sort of be summarized into two <laughs> things, or two categories, uh, which are the first one was things about can be summarized to understand your user and make design decisions that are good for them. So basically things about how to work with design. Now this list is longer than the next category of things, but it is the next category of things that I think is most important. And that category of thing is to team up with great designers and combine your powers to figure things out. So basically things about how to work and connect with designers. And with that said, I want to thank you for your time and hope you have a great rest of Svetu conference. Thank you.